today. Let's read Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. This is the Lord speaking. It says, Therefore I say unto you, <coughs> Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not light, the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. <coughs> Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, I, I, I read this passage of scripture multiple times, and I actually went through and I tried to count how many times that the Lord put the word thought in there and as simple as it may seem to count I got my count all off I counted like three times and it's more like five or six and what I want you to know is is that the word thought right there that's King James for to be anxious or to be troubled with you know when you go back through here and you see basically what the Lord's trying to tell his people you know this is the early stages of Jesus's ministry and he's Going through, he had already, he preached on the, this is part of really, if I, I'm shooting from the hip here, but this is part of his Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things that I remember about the Sermon of the Mount that sticks out to me is that this was his inaugural address as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to the <coughs> citizens that would follow him. Amen. God has a kingdom. And, and that there's a citizenry, a people that will follow after God and give their hearts to him and, and that will be part of his eternal kingdom. And he's, and he's speaking to those citizens that would give their lives and their hearts to him. And he's telling them, you don't need to be anxious. You don't need to be so consumed and concerned about what tomorrow holds that it's causing anxiety in the midst of your heart. It, you don't need to worry about things like what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear. He, he goes on to say those are the things that the Gentiles worry about. Now, the word Gentile could be interchangeably used in the King James Version for the word heathen. We've talked about that before. The Old Testament uses the word heathen a lot. Heathen and Gentile is essentially talking about the world. The world that is separate from the people of God. Israel was the people of God. The heathen nations are the nations that did not know God in the Old Testament. Gentiles were the people, groups that did not know God. And so Jesus is saying that's the kind of thing that the world worries about. They worry about what tomorrow holds. And it doesn't just lead itself or lend itself to clothing or to food, but also it lends itself to people maybe that are single in relationships or, very, or even the relationships that you're involved in today with your spouse or, or with your children. Or, and you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in all of these circumstances and situations. The Lord's saying, don't be anxious. Don't be filled with anxiety. You can't change it. it but these are the things that the world worries about. Unfortunately, the truth be told, we know that many times in the church we worry about it also. If we're honest with ourselves, we could say that the people in the world are troubled with the cares of this world because they simply don't know God. Amen. Amen. They don't know who to put their hope in. They don't know who to put their trust in. And so they look around at the mess that this fallen world is and they look around at the mess of their lives and they stress. They stress out over the situation. They stress out over what's going on in their lives. 
And you know, the sad thing is, is this, is that when they look at the mess, what they try to do is they try to fix the situation. Now, it's not just the world, it's the church too. But they, we try to fix the situation. We, we, we make plans. Now, I'm not saying that man shouldn't make plans, but the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Amen. The thoughts uh, of how he will go uh, are placed in his heart, but the Lord directs the path Amen. of the righteous. As long as we keep our hope and our faith in the Lord, the Lord will direct our path. The trouble with anxiety and the cares of the world isn't limited just to the future, though, but as a matter of fact, it's also connected to the past. You can't control the future. You can't change the past. People regret choices. And mistakes that they made in the past. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> People regret the choices and the mistakes that they made in the past. They regret the results that they've been left with from their sinful choices. Isn't that true? Amen. And now they have to live on and live through the trials that those results have left behind. Amen. You know, the old adage goes, you reap what you sow. Not the adage, but the scripture says, you reap what you sow. When we make choices in this life that are contrary to the ways and the will and the word of God, we're left with results. Choices have results. There's, a, there's an effect to the choices that we make. And, and many times it's not something that you can just fix right away. And, and you're left in the midst of a situation where there's a trial and a tribulation maybe because of those circumstances that are left over. Right. And now we have to live through them as every day comes. We have to we have to endure some of those trials that we've been faced with. It's not to say that the Lord can't heal it. It's not to say that the Lord can't deliver it, that he can't fix it because he does. He he works in our lives. But that's one of the things that the Lord said in this passage. Don't stress about what you don't know or you can't fix. You don't know what tomorrow holds. This fallen earth will present enough situations each and every day. Right. For us to deal with without you having to add worry about tomorrow. So that was really point number one. You can't control tomorrow and you can't change the past. Amen. God has tomorrow under control. I got you. I need you to know that God has tomorrow under control. And he told his disciples that in John chapter 14. I love this passage of scripture. Jesus, this is this is nearing the end of the, end of his ministry in the, in the gospel of John He's about to go to the cross and he's preparing his disciples for the fact that he will be departing from them. And, and he explains this in John chapter 14. He says, let not your heart be troubled that we have it again. Don't be anxious. Don't be consumed with the cares of the world. He said, you believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not where you go, and how can we know the way? Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me, if ye had known me. You should have known my father also, and from henceforth you know him, and you have seen him. Jesus is, we know that, looking backwards, we know he is the gate. He's the doorway. He is the access point to get to the father. He's the access point to eternal life. Jesus is explaining that to his disciples. But what I really wanted you to see here is he says, I go away to my father to prepare a place for you. There's a whole lot that could be said about that. We preached it when we preached the Jewish wedding, you know, that the that the son would be dispensed or, or sent by the father to to get himself a bride. And then after the contract was made, Jesus made a contract with mankind. He died on the cross. He sealed it with his blood. He purchased a bride for himself. Yeah. Then the groomsmen would go back to the father for a period of time until he came back to receive his bride. Basically, Jesus said, I'm going away. And when he was gone, he would prepare a place for his bride. Many times they would build it onto the side of his father's house. Jesus is building mansions in glory, amen, and preparing a place for his bride. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to tell you is that Jesus has tomorrow, the eternal tomorrow, under control. 
There's still a tomorrow that you and I will have to face on this earth and we will have to go through and deal with things. But I'm here to tell you that his grace is sufficient, that his presence will be with you, that he'll get you through every step of the way. Hallelujah. But the good news is, is that there is a tomorrow to embrace, an eternal tomorrow. That's why we must stay focused on his kingdom and his righteousness today. Amen. The Lord's preparing an eternal place, but in the meantime, in the here and now, the Lord said, today is enough to take care of. And when you're taking care of today, make sure that you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. Not the world's kingdom, not the world's righteousness. I bring that up. You know, one of the things that Paris said in his, in his message when he preached last Sunday, which is something that I talk a lot about, he used the word humanism. But the idea is, is that the world has a message that is preaching. The world has a message that is preaching, is preaching it through television, is preaching through through movie, is preaching through music. That's why hey, I'm not here to, I didn't, this isn't in my notes, but, but I'm going to say it anyway. That's why I talk a lot about the world's music and why we shouldn't listen to it. Back whenever I first started going to church, what they said was, you ought not listen to the world's music. And then they just kind of left it at that. I kind of tried to take it a step further because, like, I tried to raise my kids. Now, whether they listen to the world's music or not is on them, but I definitely have told them. But, but I always tried to teach them to, to say this. Listen, I'm going to, I'll give you some explanation. You're, you're allowed to ask some questions. As long as you're not sassy about it, you're, it's not just going to be daddy said it, so do it. Every now and then I did say that. Don't get me wrong because, I mean, sometimes they just... Sassy, but for the most part, I wanted them to be able to engage in some conversation. I wanted them to be able to learn from it. So that's what I'm going to kind of do. Not that I'm your father, but that's what I kind of want to do when I preach too. I want us to be able to think. Amen. And the reason that we don't listen to the music of the world is because it sends a message. One time I preached a message specifically on this, and I was actually having a conversation with Paris about this. Uh, you know, that we were talking about the music of the world, about humanism and how this world is trying to infiltrate our minds and our hearts with its message. And I can remember when I preached on that message, there was I, I just Googled the top songs. I think one was in country, two of them, the top two songs in country music, because, you know, a lot of times people feel like country music's OK. You know, it's not like, you know, listening to the Prince of Darkness, Ozzy Osbourne, you know. Uh, but but so I googled country music songs. Well, the first one in the lyrics of the song it said, "I think I'm going to sit right here on this pier and have myself a beer." And the idea was was that he was going through some trials and some tribulation in his life. He had some circumstances that his heart was broken over, and that was how he's going to fix it. I'm going to sit on this pier right here and have myself a beer. He's going to drown his sorrows. Now, can I tell you that that is not the answer uh, to, the, to the situations that we face? Right. But that's what the music of the world will try to convince you of. Then there was another song where this old girl, she did an interview and, and, she, and she gave the diagnosis of what the song was really about. But, the, but the, the concept of the song was let your heart be your compass. And so what she said whenever they asked her, what does this mean? It, well, it means that whatever your heart is telling you to do, that's the direction that you should go in. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Yes. Jeremiah said the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Mankind in his own heart schemes up his own uh, in, imaginations and wants to go the way that he wants to go. And the world system out there wants to cause you and encourage you to go in your own direction. And I'm here to tell you that that is not the way, that is not God's kingdom and that is not his righteousness. God's word speaks on the direction that mankind should go. God's spirit through his word directs mankind in the direction that he should go. Today is going to offer enough evil or enough bad times or enough things for you and I to concern ourselves with. But in the meantime, what we should be seeking after is God's kingdom and his righteousness. If we don't, can only get a revelation of that, you know, that we can't control tomorrow and we sure can't fix the past. You know, I know the Apostle Paul had a revelation of that. Look at Philippians 3.13. I'm talking about the past right now. You're not going to control. You can't you can't control tomorrow, but you also can't fix the past. The Apostle Paul definitely had a revelation of that. Look at this. 3.13. That's enough water right there to wet your whistle. <laughs> you like that little bottle of water. Amen. Philippians 3.13. The Apostle Paul says, Brethren, I count myself 
I count not myself to have apprehended. What does he mean? He, he, I haven't arrived yet. I haven't come to the complete place of fulfillment and maturity in whatever it is that happened to me. If you go on and you read the whole passage, he said, I basically he's saying I've been apprehended by something that I want to apprehend. In other words, he was overtaken by the love and the power of God and it yeah. so transformed his life that in turn he was wanting to go after yeah, that very that. thing that gotten a hold of him so that he could get a hold of more of it. But then now he's saying, but I haven't really gotten there quite yet. He said, but there's one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind and I reach forth unto those things which are before. It, you know, if you know the story of the Apostle Paul, that you have to know that there were undoubtedly some regrets in his heart and in his mind. I, how many times for you yourself, I mean, I'm just saying, like I know it happens to me, so I imagine it happens to you, that you'll walk into a situ a, a, an environment. You'll walk, I don't know, just... Just bear with me. You walk in some place and there's a smell. Or you walk in some place where you had been before and all of a sudden <clears throat> it causes a chemical in your brain to elicit a memory. Right. And, and, you, and you remember something. And sometimes there's memories of joy and sometimes there's memories of pain. I got to tell you that the Apostle Paul had a whole lot of memories that he had. And even once you're converted, listen to me, sometimes there's memories of mistakes that you've made in the past. You can't fix the past. The Apostle Paul knew this. But if anybody ever had to have had a flood of memories of negative things and circumstances that he had to have gone through, then it had to be the Apostle Paul. I mean, listen, the word of God says in the book of Acts that there was a time frame when he was going to Damascus to get letters from the leadership of the Jewish leaders in order to imprison Christians and to put them to death. Whenever he was knocked down on the ground by the light of God and the voice of God spoke from heaven and transformed his life, he was on his way to put more Christians in prison and to have prisoners put to death. Then I think about, you know, he doesn't really mention it. That, I can, that I've ever found, but I've oftentimes thought about the fact of how Stephen's death had to have come back and just been like this thing that was burned on the inside of his mind. You remember the story of death? How, what a dramatic image or, or, or a vision of something that he must have, that he experienced and that he must have thought about. I'm trying to talk to you a little bit about regrets and mistakes that have been made in the past and how you can't fix them. And if anybody would have had them, it would have been the Apostle Paul. And he's saying, listen, I don't look backwards at those things. But if you'll remember Stephen, what did it say? The Bible says that Saul, before his conversion and his name changed to Paul, was consenting unto Stephen's death. You remember that Stephen had stood up to the religious leaders he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to the religious leaders. They became so angry with him. The Bible says that they gnashed on him with their teeth. There was a mob that, that overtook him. And the next thing you know, they asked Saul because he was the leader. He was the highest ranking official that was present. And he gave them the okay to stone Stephen. They began to pelt him with stones. The Bible says that from Stephen's perspective, that he saw the heavens open and that he was able to see the Son of Man. You know, I preached a message one time on that when it said Jesus stood because the Bible says Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the reason that he's seated is because his work is done. The book of Hebrews says that those priests of old time, they never got to sit down. They always stood up because their work was never completed because they were men of sin and they had to offer up sacrifice for their own sin. But Jesus as a high priest, hallelujah, had no sin and he offered himself as a sacrifice for the sin of man and it was a finished work. That's why Jesus said it is finished and he sat down but on that day when Stephen was stoned the Bible says Jesus was standing up. Jesus was standing up and I don't know you know there's a scripture that says that the angels peer over heaven into this thing called salvation and I just see Jesus standing there this is my commentary and saying Stephen just hold on one minute longer just hold on just a little bit longer because soon you'll be in glory but think about this image in the apostle Paul's mind remembering backwards of all of the things that he had done contrary and he does talk about that in some of his letters about how he persecuted the church more than anybody else. And I know that there was regret in his heart, but he knew he couldn't fix it. He said, I'll look before. 
The word before means in the sight of. There's enough work that needs to be done today for the kingdom of God and seeking after his righteousness that we don't look backwards on the regrets right of the past. Look, the rear view mirror causes the wrong kind of sorrow. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. Looking in the rearview mirror causes the wrong kind of sorrow. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, it says, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. What does that mean? The word repent means to change your mind. So godly, godly sorrow will cause a person to change their mind about sin. And then he goes on to say not to be repented of. In other words, don't change your mind from that. Change your mind from sin, but don't change your mind that godly sorrow is a good thing. Amen? Amen. It says, but the sorrow of the world works death. Many times people feel regret and sorrow from their failures and their past. Certainly there is good when it comes to godly sorrow. It means grief. It means pain. It means affliction. And listen, grief over sin that comes from God is a form of chastisement. God will use in his people's lives to bring them to a place of repentance. God uses sorrow, godly sorrow, to bring a man to repentance. Yes. To, to allow a man to realize that he's heading in the wrong direction. God loves you. He's like a father that chastises his children. Yes. The book of Hebrews talks about that. What kind of a father would not chastise his children? The Bible says that we've had fathers on earth that chastise us or disciplines us. Disciplined us. And that the, our God in heaven will do the same. But when we hold on to it. See, that's the difference. Godly sorrow is a lot different than worldly sorrow. Mm -hmm. Godly sorrow will bring you to repentance. Worldly sorrow will just condemn you. Condemn you and make you feel guilty. Make you feel unworthy. Cause you to hold on to all those sorrows and those, and those regrets. And, and ultimately... It leads to death. And when we start to concern ourselves with the fact that the way things are not the way that we want them to be in this life or, or that because we can't change it and we try to hold on to it and we want to try to fix it and, and it ends up leading to deathly to death is what it does because it's worldly sorrow. What we can change is the way we see this world and the sin it offers. But the only way that will ever change is if our mind is changed through his word. Look at 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. See, we hold on to the regrets of the past, but the Lord is faithful that if we would just confess to him. Amen. Scripture says that we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you know, it doesn't matter what the child of God has been through. It doesn't matter what your past holds. If you're faithful to confess your sins to the Lord, he is faithful to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Amen. You know, I love that word confess right there. And I know I use, I've used this a lot in a lot of my messages, but I, I just love, you know how I love Greek words, but... This word is, is this word in the Greek. If you were going to spell it in, 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 in English, it's one word, but it's broken up into two words. It's homologia. Homa, or we would, I mean, I'm not trying to be weird, but we used to hear this like homo. It means same. And logia means word. The idea is to say the same thing. Basically, when you confess your sins, it means to say the same thing as another. When you confess your sins before God, it means you're saying the same thing about your sin that God says about That's your right, sin. Right. Not the message of the world. The, the world says, let your heart be the compass. The world says it's okay to go your own way and to allow yourself to be led in what makes you feel good. But what the Lord said, and, and many times when they're telling you to do that, it's, it's all sin that they're telling you to engage in. But what the word of the Lord says is something completely different. The word of the Lord has a different message. And when we confess our sin before God in order to be cleansed by God is because we're saying the same thing about it as what God has said in his word. And what every believer must remember once again is that God is faithful as long as we're willing to call sin, sin. Amen. That brings me to point number two. Today's message for the world is this. It's. Today is the day. Amen. Look at Joel chapter 3 verse 14. Today is the day of salvation. Joel 3 14. It says multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near 
in the valley of decision. The prophet Joel is seeing the fact that there's coming the day of wrath where judgment will come on the nations of the earth. And every human being that has rebelled against God and his plan will be judged. I don't know how you feel about that. <clears throat> and the reason I ask is because I know what the modern church has done is the modern church has tried to take the ways of the world and let the, their own heart be their compass and allow the, the message of the world to infiltrate it. And it no longer likes to talk about sin and no longer likes to talk about judgment because it makes people feel uncomfortable. And it's a real hard thing to fill the church and fill the pews in the church whenever you make people feel uncomfortable. That's but right. I'm here to tell you today, the prophet Joel saw something that you and I need to be reminded of. There's coming a day where the wrath of God will be poured out on unrepentant men. And there's multitudes. Today, I need to tell you that there's multitudes in the valley of decision. Because the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. There are multitudes of individuals that need to make a choice on whether or not they will serve the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. He says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. That word secured is another word for delivered. The Lord says, I have delivered you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God calls sinners to repent with urgency. God calls sinners to repent with urgency. The Bible teaches us that none of us are promised tomorrow. James said that our life is like a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And if we're going to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we will have to hunger to see lost souls won to the kingdom of God. That's the last thing. That's one of the last things that the Lord told us before he left. Amen. You remember that? Matthew 28, 18 through 19. The Bible says Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's one of the last things that the Lord told us. This is the message for the world today. The message for the world today is that there is judgment coming on unrepentant man. But, the, but that message for the world is inside of you. Amen. The message for the world is inside of you. When you got saved, when you homologued according to God's word, then a miracle happened on the inside of your heart. You were transformed from the old man that you were born of Adam into a new man born again in Christ. Amen. The Holy Ghost now lives on the inside of you. You are the temple of the living God and the, and the presence of God on the inside of you. The word of God says in Jeremiah 31, 31, it says that in those days in the new covenant, I will write my law on the inside of their hearts. Listen, the Holy Spirit, the author of the law lives on the inside of your heart and his word is now on the inside of your heart. And it's a message and a word that God wants to come out of you and to go into the world. We talked about that a little bit last week, if I remember correctly, about, about being a witness. Amen. And, and being a witness to a lost and a dying world. And the truth be told is that that's our purpose on this life. Listen right, to me. Right, you, got, right. you, got to, you have to get a revelation of this. You might end up being a millionaire. We might have millionaires sitting in here right now. I believe that. People that own businesses that, that may prosper and become millionaires. People that end up going, you know, but we, we may have, we have, I don't know, Bella, she might be a nurse anesthetist one day. You know, I'm a nurse practitioner. Some of you, whatever it is that you do on, in, the, in the real world and you engage people on a regular basis. But let me tell you something. You're going to be buying another lie if you think that your purpose on this earth was to be a millionaire. Yeah. You're going to buy a lie if you think your purpose on this earth was to be a nurse anesthetist or to be a nurse practitioner. That's your occupation. Amen. God allowed you and he blessed you. Amen. And, and he will allow you to do what it is that he's called you to do in order to take care of yourself. Take no thought for tomorrow. He will take care of you. But your purpose on this earth was to make a decision on what you were going to do with the son. Hallelujah. And once you make that decision to receive the son by faith, now your purpose on this earth is to be a voice yes. of truth. 
to a lost and a dying world. Listen to me. Not everybody in this room is called to stand up. I'm not going to do it. I used to, but I'm not. To stand up on a chair, to stand up on a podium outside with a megaphone or carry a cross through the middle of the streets. God may have told me to do that on a few occasions. I'm going to still probably do it for the festival, but not everybody's necessarily called to do it that way. And you can rest assured and you can... Take a deep breath and let it out and rest and know that God has not necessarily called you to be a evangelist on the street or to be a preacher that stands behind a pulpit. You don't have to stress about all that. But guess what? God has called you to live for Jesus. You're either going to live for him or you're not. And if you're going to live for him, he has called you, amen, to live for him. And that he should be, listen to me, if you've been born again and the spirit of God lives on the inside of you, if you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, he should sometimes be the topic of your conversation. Amen. Is it okay if I preach the truth? Yes. He should sometimes be the, the, what you talk about. Yes. He's the darling of heaven. God bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession in order to purchase salvation for sinners like you and me. And whenever that truth comes on the inside of our heart, there should be a burden lifted and a desire to share that truth with a lost and a dying world. Oh, but preacher, I'm going through stuff. I know. You can't, you can't fix the past and you can't control tomorrow. I got worries and anxiety. I, I get all that. But you put your hope and your trust in the Lord. I know you live in a real world and you're going through things. But listen, your purpose on this earth is to bring glory to God. The question is, will we fulfill that purpose? Amen. Lord, help us to fulfill that purpose. Amen. Because I don't know about you, but I've tried to fulfill it in my own strength before, and I made a mess of it. We need the Holy Spirit to open up the doors. Amen. And to use us and to lead us and guide us. I don't know about, have you ever tried to do that in your own strength? Because I'm not even encouraging you to do that. I just want you to know that. I am not encouraging you to try to witness the people or to live for the Lord out loud in front of people in your own strength. That is one of the most miserable places that you will ever be. But if you will ask the Lord to do the work in the inside of your heart, I kind of really went off on this verse of scripture. I guess the Lord really wanted to preach this this morning. That was his, one of his last things he said. He said that. He said, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore, teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the message for the world. Judgment's coming, but God has a plan. Amen. Message for the church is that we should abide until he comes. Look at John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. This is a long passage of scripture. But let's just read it. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Now, you know what that means is, is a husbandman is a term an old English term for someone that would take care of the vines, the vineyard, if you will. I, I'm real familiar with the word because I've studied a lot why, what it meant by that. I, all I just know is, is that if you can imagine, it's a, like a farmer of a vineyard. And what he does is he takes care of all the vines that are out there and he's real meticulous. And he'll go out there and if he sees some bad branches or whatever, he'll prune them. You know, I would imagine you had to be pretty patient to be a husband. And I don't think that that would be a good job for me. I'm not a very patient person, but you kind of walk through the vineyard. And when you see things that aren't right, you prune them, you get rid of things. You know, it's a, it's, it's a great job for somebody that's good at it. People that love agriculture and horticulture and things like that. But anyway, I just want you to know that's what it means. So the father's taking care of a vineyard. Jesus says, I am divine. Amen. There's a root system. I mean, I'm kind of just speaking from the heart right here. There's a root system. It's called the plan of salvation. And from that root system, Jesus is the true vine. Amen. Yeah. And there's branches that come forth out of that vine and the branches bear fruit. Amen. And the branches, I'm going to mention this a little bit later, so I'm going to say it now. There were natural born branches and that was Israel because they were God's original people that he created from the man named Abraham. But guess what? There's also 
wild branches yes, that were Jesus. grafted in. Yes. And those are the people like you and me that were grafted into the vine. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. So Jesus says, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Romans chapter 11, the Bible says that some of the, that the, some of the natural branches were cut off. They were pruned. And he goes on to say the reason they were pruned was because of unbelief. They did not believe ultimately in Jesus like they were supposed to. It says he purges it so that it might bring forth more fruit. I don't know much about pruning, but I have heard that the reason that you prune is because especially like at the bottom of a vine or a bottom of a tree, there could be these branches. I think they're called suckers. They kind of suck the life out of the thing. You get rid of those and it allows the nutrients to go to the branches that are supposed to be there so that they can receive, um, produce more fruit. Jesus goes on to say, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy might be full. That's part of the problem on why we don't feel the joy of the Lord. That's part of the problem why we're overcome by anxieties and worries and the cares of this world is because we're not learning how to abide in the vine. And instead of the joy of the Lord remaining on the inside of our hearts, we're getting caught up as we look around at the circumstances and the situations that we're dealing with. Now, listen, I'm closing with two questions. So just bear with me. I'm closing right here. What does it mean to be connected to the vine? And number two, how do I abide? Most of you already know the answers to all of this, right? But let's just go ahead and go through it. It says the way that we were first connected to the vine was simply when we were born again. Yes. When you heard the gospel of truth. Paul said, you believed from your heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. The word doctrine means instruction. You were told the gospel of Jesus Christ and you believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth that you were a sinner, that you needed a savior. And when you did that, something, a miracle happened in the spiritual realm. The old man that was born like Adam was translated by the person of the Holy Spirit. The word of God says in Colossians 1, 13, that you were translated from the kingdom of darkness and that you were now translated to the kingdom of his dear son. From darkness to light, you were converted, you were saved, and the Holy Spirit has come to live in you. So that's what it means to, to be connected to the vine. But now, how do I abide? Well, I'm going to save that for just one second. I want you to know that whenever you were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that you were grafted. Kind of like that wild olive branch that, that, that the Apostle Paul talked about in the book of Romans. You know, I thought about this one time when I was preaching a message and I'll never, I just love this idea. This is just me kind of talking. This is the way the Lord speaks to my heart. So, so just bear with me. You know, in your, in, in, in originally in creation, you know what God did? How did God create Eve from Adam. from Adam. He took a rib out of Adam's side and he made a bride for Adam, right? Whenever Jesus died on the cross, this to me is beautiful. You may not buy into it with me, but, but I just think it's beautiful. Whenever Jesus died on the cross, he was slid into his side. You know, in order to graft a branch, you got to cut into the tree. And then from when you cut into the tree, you put the branch in there. Just as God took a bride out of Adam's side, God put a bride inside of Jesus' side. It was like a grafted vine, and God took you and I, a wild olive branch, and he stuck us on the inside of there. Jesus is saying, I'm the vine, you're the branch, you have to abide in me. 
The word abide means to live somewhere. To live somewhere, to dwell there. It means to remain and to stay. Spiritually speaking, through faith, that is what we have to do. We have to daily remain in Christ. How do I do that? Well, put up Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. How do I abide? It's a real simple message. It's so simple that we forget it. That's right. It's so simple that we get caught up in the cares of the world and we forget the simplicity of the gospel. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Here it is. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive it? Faith. 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 Amen. Amen. That you didn't work it. You didn't read enough. You didn't go to church enough. You didn't pray hard enough. You didn't get baptized enough times. No, you didn't work it. Jesus did the work. You believed it. The same way you received him is the same way you shall walk in him. Each and every day, what you do is you keep faith in Christ and what Christ accomplished for you on the cross. And you know what that does? It keeps you in a proper place of righteousness. It keeps you in right standing with God. It gives you access to the grace of God. That's Romans chapter 5 verse 2. It gives you access to the grace of God. And it's the grace of God that gives you the power to stand for the Lord in the midst of trying times, in the midst of situations, whenever you see the cares of the world trying to overtake you. It's simple faith in Christ Amen. and the flow of grace. Listen, I'm going to close this. I'm really closing right now. Grace. I give this definition a lot. I used to give it a lot more. I'm going to give it again today. It's a good definition. It comes straight out of the Strong's Greek Dictionary. It's in the middle. I remember when I first read it. One morning, it was about 5 o'clock in the morning, I was studying. I don't know, it had to be 15 years ago or more. And when I read that middle part of that definition, I literally jumped up in my living room. And I was like, I was, I was, man, I'm telling you, I was so excited. You might not get that excited right now, but that's how excited I was. It said, grace is a divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. What I read, what I saw right there, divine means God. What does that mean? It means God's the one that does the work on the inside of the man. I was over here all my life as a Christian trying to do all kind of work on the outside to try to change the inside. And with that morning, with the Lord spoke, I know it has to be revelation. That can't just be me speaking it. The Holy Ghost has to speak it to you. But, what, but the Holy Spirit spoke it to me. That It's like the words left off the page and said, your problem is, son, is that I'm the one that does the work. You need a revelation of that. Grace changes you inwardly and it affects you so much that it starts to flow out of you. As you keep faith in what Christ has already done, the grace that comes from the Holy Spirit. And you know it's the Holy Spirit that does the work in your life. Right. Each and every day as you're walking through this sin-riddled world and you're seeing a change take place in your life or you're seeing the comfort of God in your life, it's coming from the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working in your life and the Holy Spirit works based upon what Jesus has already done. Yeah. Jesus already purchased grace for you. Amen. And as you keep faith in the Lord, as you abide in him, as you dwell there and live there, the grace of the Holy Spirit is moving and operating on the inside of your life, causing a change to the point where, listen, God will allow it to be reflected outwardly and it will begin to affect other people around you.